good morning. It's great to see you on this Palm Sunday. Can we stand together and worship? Look at that, that's the enthusiasm we're looking for. You are 
Thank you. 
world and they stand here to sing your praises hearts full of thanksgiving thank you Lord God thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus This morning we cry, Hosanna. Yes. We've come to praise you, to lift you high, to remind ourselves that you are the God who has saved us. You have stepped into the mess of our lives and intervened. You brought about our adoption, the sonship. We have been redeemed. And so this morning we say thank you, God. Our hearts are full of gratitude. And we give you praise for who you are. The one who sits enthroned above it all. Who laughs as nations rage against him. who weighs the mountains as if they were dust. You are worthy of our praise and our adoration. Amen. And we say, Lord, this morning, have your way Amen. in our lives. Come and do what only you can. Move by the power of your spirit in and through us, we pray. And as we gather in this place this morning, be glorified. Be lifted high. May you be given your rightful place and may you be magnified in our sight. Amen. Come and have your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please feel free to take your seats. If you're a child and you're heading out to Children's Church, now's your moment. Good morning. It's great to see you. Happy Palm Sunday. I don't know if that's a thing, but happy Palm Sunday. I'm going to read from Ephesians 6 if you want to turn there, just to shock you all. Um, while you're turning there, let me make a, a couple of announcements. We're here on Friday at 10.30 for a communion service as we celebrate Good Friday together. And then on Easter Sunday we're together celebrating the risen and resurrected Saviour. And we'd love you to join us for both of those services if you can. And then the 17th of April, which is a Wednesday night, at 7.30, Edom churches from across the northeast are going to be here together for a joint prayer and worship evening. If you're able to join us, we'd love to have you. Um, if you want to come and meet my boss and express your frustration at me, um, there's your opportunity. So if nothing else, hey. You might get something off your chest about. Um, and then, thank you to those of you who have signed up to help us keep the building clean. Um, not this Saturday coming, but the following Saturday. I don't have a date in my head, so I can't tell you. But there will be a, a training day here at 10 o'clock. I'm not expecting it to take all day. Um, but if you're not confident about the date, go and see Louise, because she'll be back. Though she did tell me it was in January this morning. So, um, yeah. And then if you signed up to help us with refreshments, um, if you could see Louise after the service, that would be wonderful. There we go. I felt like an awful lot of announcements. I'm sorry. Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of evil. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. It's Palm Sunday. It's the day we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And I appreciate Ephesians 6 doesn't feel very Palm Sunday. But if you stick with me, I'll try and get there. We've been looking at the armour of God in Ephesians 6 for a little while. And so we're in the second half of verse 17, where we're instructed to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In our effort to stand against the devil's dreams and put on the whole armour of God so that we might be able to stand when the day of evil comes, we need to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I made an observation last week, I think, about the significant overlap of the bits of armour. Perhaps nothing is more true than this bit. Because every week, in order to talk to you about the other bits of armour, I've opened up the Bible and tried to say something from it. So the word of God is truth. John 17, verse 17, sanctify them by your, the truth. Your word is truth, is what Jesus prays for his disciples. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endure forever. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 15, and says, do your best to present yourself as to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. John 8, verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The word of God's what reveals righteousness and trains us for it. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture is God is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's where I understand the gospel of peace. Ephesians 1 and verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. It is how I get faith and grow in faith. Yeah. Romans 10 verse 17. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing through the word of God. It is how I understand salvation and the hope of salvation. And it's the means by which it happens. 1 Peter 1 verse 23. You've been born again. Not of perishable seed but of imperishable. Through the living and abiding word of God. James 1 and verse 18. He chose us, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So we've spent time looking at those individually. And I've tried to offer the word of God in relation to all of them, to you. It is where I find truth. And with that truth, I overcome the lies of an enemy. It's how I understand righteousness, and it judges the thoughts and attitudes of my heart. That's what Hebrews 4 verse 12 says. 
and it shows me how to walk righteously. It is where the truth of the gospel of peace is made known to me, and I'm able to embrace that truth, declare it, and stand in it. It's where I find and build faith, and I'm saved because I accepted the truth of the word of God. I've been born again through it, and I have hope of salvation by believing it. So I feel like I could say a lot this morning. But it's Palm Sunday. So let me read John 12. John 12 and verse 12 says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees say, said to one another, see this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Palm Sunday, for me, doesn't seem to fit the Easter story. It might just be me, but let me explain my... What follows Jesus' triumphal entry, where the crowds gather, lay their coats on the street, wave their palm branches, shout Hosanna, is Jesus looks over the city and cries. It's what Luke 19 tells us. Then on the Monday, he goes into the temple with a whip, and cleanses the temple is how we put it. Or flips the table over and goes a bit nuts at them. He spends Tuesday teaching. But not really exciting things. But about end times and the challenges of it. About how awful the Pharisees are. And he gets stuck right into them. We get to Thursday where he has... The Last Supper talks about being betrayed, experiences that betrayal in the garden, and then obviously he's crucified on Friday. Saturday's a bit. And Sunday, as much as, obviously, it's Resurrection Sunday and, and we love it, it's not, they've not quite got it at Resurrection Sunday. It's a bit of a difficult day, really, because the, the ones who come and find out he's risen go back and say he's risen, and they go, is your mental health okay? Have you got a bit mad? And they divided over this. And this big celebration on Palm Sunday doesn't seem to fit with the week that follows. This big event of, woo, Jesus is here. This is great. Doesn't seem to really sit right with the rest of... And what's central to this moment is not the big party, but the fulfillment of prophecy. It's the fulfillment of Zechariah's words in chapter 9 and verse 9. And here is Christ on the way to the cross fulfilling that. 
Matthew 21 and verse 21 says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to your daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is a big moment. The whole city is stirred by it. Jesus is fulfilling the word of God in the Messianic prophecy, demonstrating who he is. And the disciples are at the center of celebrating it. Luke 19 records, as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the roads. As he was drawing near, already on their way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The disciples are central to the celebration. They're shouting. But what John 12, 16 tells me is they didn't understand what was happening. Let me go back there. <laughs> Verse 14 says, Jesus found a young donkey and sat in it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's coat. Verse 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, and that these things had been done to him. They didn't understand what was going on. But there's no resistance to it. They don't stop and say, Lord, what's happening here? It's good. And it seems good. So it's easy to embrace. But a week later, something else has happened that they didn't understand. And it's changed everything. Luke 24, verse 13, says that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a, a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish are you? And how slow to believe all the things the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them 
what was said in all scripture concerning himself. I've taken a while to get here, but here's the thing I want to try and think with you about this morning. The importance of the word of God in your life is not about the seasons that are good, but the seasons that are bad. It is easy to embrace the things I don't understand that are good. It is easy to join the crowd in shouting Hosanna and celebrate and still not understand what's going on. But when Jesus is dead and he's hung on a cross and he went into the tomb and they're saying he's not there anymore but he doesn't really sit right with me and fit right and I don't know It's not easy to carry on going along with it in those moments. It's not easy just to keep walking with it in those times in ignorance. In both situations, this is God fulfilling his word. Jesus doesn't say to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, let me tell you a lovely story. He opens up the scriptures and he shows them through the scriptures why these things had to happen. The triumphal entry is the fulfillment of prophecy. But the reality is the absence of a healthy understanding of the word of God leads us to determine what our situations are according to how they feel how does this feel and the triumphal entry feels good right so that must be good but the cross doesn't feel good the empty tomb where we don't really know what's happening doesn't feel good. So it can't be good then, surely. And we know it is. We know we're going to celebrate Good Friday. That at the cross Jesus made a public spectacle out of principalities and powers triumphing over them. It's a good thing. That at the cross he bore my sin and my shame. That he tore the veil into and gave me access to God. And the empty two means I'm going to rise. I'm going to live forever. It's all good. The challenge is the moments don't always feel it. And we've been looking at the armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, we might be able to take our stand in preparation for something. So let me remind you of Jesus' words in Matthew 7. Verse 24 says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Mm. What causes the instability of the house that's built on sand? It's not the sunshine. It was just so warm. The weather was just so good. 
It's the storm. It's the challenge. It's when the wind begins to rattle the walls that you see what the foundation is made of. When the water starts pouring down, you find out what's there. And the challenge for us is that I need to have implemented the word of God, taken hold of it in my life for when the storm comes. That I've got hold of it, that I know the truth, that I'm walking in it. For when the challenge comes, I don't need it necessarily when things are good at times. Hebrews 6 and verse 12 says, We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all arguments. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. What hope is it? It's that through faith and patience I'm going to inherit what was promised. That through faith and patience I'm going to inherit what was promised. That's the hope that anchors my soul. Why does my soul need to be anchored? Because it takes a battering sometimes. Because the storms come. Because life gets tough. And so I need to know what was promised. That there's something coming. That it's not all here and now. Because I can't necessarily judge what God's doing by how it feels. At youth on Friday night, we're talking about growing spiritually through suffering. Right? The idea that suffering is achieving something in us. That enduring through hardship develops us in Christ. So we're told to consider it pure joy when we suffer trials of many kind. To let perseverance finish its work in us that we might become mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's doing something good even though it feels bad. It's achieving something good in you though it feels bad. The 
that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts. It's achieving something good, though it feels bad, though it's difficult, though it's hard, though I'm not at ease with it, though I don't particularly enjoy it. But I need to know that truth. While it's happening. I need to know that all things are going to work together. For the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That he has begun a good work in me and he is seeing it through to completion. But I need to know that. In the midst of the challenging seasons, when the storms of life rage, I need that hope to anchor my soul that he's not done with me yet, that it's not over, that I will reign in glory with him, whatever this life looks like. Is it very warm in here, is it me? Goodness me. If I collapse, I'll be all right. I'm intrigued by the statement in John 12, verse 16, that tells us the disciples didn't understand. Because it, it doesn't seem to matter. Thank you, Ru. Um, it didn't stop them embracing the moment. But I can't be a fair weather Christian. I can't be here for only the good times. I can't walk this just in the sunshine. And the triumphal entry is great. And when people line the streets and celebrate Jesus, I'll embrace it and enjoy it. But you better believe they're going to cry crucify him too. And I'm going to have to live with the tension of that. That Sunday might feel great, but the rest of the week might feel like an utter mess at times. I want to be standing at the end of it. Good times, yeah. bad times. I don't want my feelings to dictate my standing. I don't want my interpretation of what might be happening in the moment to allow me to determine whether or not I'm a, I want to live out the truth of this. And he's told me in this world I'll have trouble. He's told me the world's going to hate you. That you're going to face persecution. That everybody's not going to say, Josh, tell us about your God. The people aren't necessarily going to be like, hey, isn't it great you're a Christian? Well, you can expect them to treat you the way they treated him. Yeah. That's what he told me. Yeah. And apparently that wasn't very well. They stuck him on a cross. But I need to know that. And I think we miss the privilege we have. And I've talked to you about this. In opening up this book, I think we miss it.
because we're busy trying to tick the box. I want to know that I've put a solid foundation in because I've chosen to implement the Word of God in my life. I want to know that I've got an anchor that will hold. When the storm comes, because I am persuaded of the hope to which I've been called. And there's an enemy that is committed to lying to you. There's an enemy that wants to deceive you. There is spiritual warfare. That's why we're in Ephesians 6. Don't let this become a chore. Please let me urge you. This book is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It will transform your life if you let it. But if it becomes a chore, if you disregard it, If it's something that you want to contest when it suits you. Might not serve you brilliantly. And it's great to know. That through the good times, God's at work. And through the bad times, he's still at work. And when it seems great and glorious, he's fulfilling his purpose. And when it seems miserable and awful, he's still fulfilling his purpose. That what he has spoken will come to pass. That he started something he is finishing. But it doesn't always look like it. And it doesn't always feel like it. But I have established that this word is truth yeah. for me, for life, for everything. Yes. And he's told me The suffering's doing something good. The hardship's producing something good. Frustrating and difficult as it is right now. Mature and complete, not lacking anything. I fancy that. But I've got to persevere apparently. And I'll persevere earns to finish its work. So I appreciate that not might, might not have been the Palm Sunday message you were expecting. And it might not have been the sword of spirit message you're expecting. But I am standing against an enemy. I don't just need to know the good things it says. Hear what I'm saying? Mm. 
We all like, you know, God will grant you the desires of your heart. That's nice, isn't it? But I live in a real world with real opposition, with real challenge. I need to know, Jesus told me in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I need to know that he's told me family members are going to betray each other on account of him. Well, that's nice, isn't it? No. But it will help me stand when an enemy wants to tell me it's only me. That, that if God really loved you, it wouldn't let it happen. He has told me. He told me in advance it would happen. He let me know. And he's still at work for good in it all. Romans 15 and verse 4. It says everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Doesn't matter. What the devil's got to say as far as I'm concerned. He can tell me how awful I am. And at times... He's right. <laughs> but I have person after person after person who in spite of their limitations, God took hold of them and used them in scripture. He can tell me how bad my situation is. And he might be right. But I read... In the heroes of faith. Of those who were destitute. Living in caves. Sawn in two. And the world was not worthy of them. God was still out working his purpose. In them. Through them. I don't fancy it. But just because it doesn't feel good. I don't want to find myself in a place. Where I've abandoned. The truth. And some of us. We need to make some effort. At understanding the word of God. Not just reading it. To say we read it. To embracing the truth of what it says. So that having done all the stand. We stand. Should we stand together and worship?
you have prepared in advance for us and this morning Lord we declare we trust you through the great and the glorious and the seemingly not so we trust you Lord we pray that your word would take root in our hearts that we would be confident and assured of your truth as we walk through the challenging seasons of life. Help us, Lord, to live 
as you have instructed us to, to practice the word of God, to be doers and not just hearers, so that we can build stable foundations through the storm of life. And Lord, we pray that as we take hold of truth, you would silence the voice of an enemy who seeks to derail us and destroy us. May we have confidence in your words. May we approach it with assurance that everything you've spoken will come to pass. That not one of your words will fail. That well, the, gla the grass withers and the flowers fade. Your word stands forever. So be exalted, we pray. And help us to walk faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. God bless you. It's great to see you and we'll see you soon.